Hi everyone, as Tom mentioned, my name is Val. I work on Mongoose. Um, it's really great to be here. This is, uh, it's been nine years since my first MongoDB world. So it's a real honor to finally be able to, uh, to speak. It's been uh, really excited to be here. So thank you guys all for having me. Today I'm talking about winning out data wrangling with the Mongoose migration framework. A little bit about me. Um, I am the core maintainer of Mongoose since 2014. Um, I took over the project from the uh, from the pre from a keynote speaker from yesterday, uh, Guillermo Roch. Um, Mongoose is now the most downloaded uh, database framework in Node.js with any database, and it's also pretty much the de facto choice for uh, for Node.js and MongoDB. Um, in my professional career, I was one of the first 300 employees here at MongoDB um, back in 2013. Um, I co-founded a startup called Level Up, which got acquired by Grubhub in 2018. And most recently, I worked at Booster Fuels, a company that just raised a Series D round a couple of weeks ago. I was one of the, uh, I was pretty much the first engineering hire there, and now they're almost a unicorn, so that's good. Um, and now I run a dev shop called Mainit Software. We're based out of Miami Beach, Florida, and we do uh, web app development for a bunch of clients, as well as develop some, uh, some cool products like, uh, like the Mongoose Migration Framework for our clients to use, like, uh, like Steve over here in Burb. <laughs> Say hi, Steve. So first, let's talk a little bit about what data wrangling is, what migrations are, and what, I'm, uh, what we're talking about here. Because again, the, uh, the definitions kind of help to really frame the problem and define what we're, uh, what we're trying to build here. So uh, data wrangling, in my experience, is the process of ensuring that data is consistent, both from a structural perspective and a semantic perspective. So obviously, data wrangling, um, migrations are often used to just add and remove fields from the database or change the type of a given field. That's the structural perspective. But we also care about the semantic perspective in terms of we want the data to be correct from, uh, from the business perspective. We want the data team to be able to, uh, to look at the data with confidence. We want users to see what they expect in, when they log in. We want all these things. Um, and a migration is just a one-off script for, uh, for updating data and making sure that things are consistent in the database. So at my, at my previous role at Booster, by the time I left, we were shipping about 30 migrations a week. Um, these are all just one-off scripts that go into a GitHub repo, and we run them in order to make sure our data is consistent. Now, a couple of examples of scripts that, uh, that we ran towards the tail end of my time there. Um, one script, we, uh, we changed the settlement date for five transactions because for some reason the settlement date was wrong. Um, another example, we, uh, we wrote some code that did uh, that relied on driving directions. So we stored driving directions as GeoJSON line strings in MongoDB. And, in, and when we first wrote that code, we were only doing that sort of, that logic for one region. So when we decided to expand it to multiple regions, we decided, okay, we need to set a region ID property. So we're adding a new field here. Uh, that's a pretty standard migration. Um, another example, um, when we first wrote uh, our order logic, we made it so that the start time property was set to when the order was scheduled to start, not when it was actually started, as in the user clicked start. So this was a bit of a semantic misinterpretation that made the data team's life difficult because we didn't really have a property that stored when the user actually clicked start. So we migrated so that start time referred to when the user clicked start as opposed to when, uh, when the order was scheduled to start. Now, uh, the first and third migration here are very different from what you would normally think of a migration framework as doing. Um, for example, if you've ever worked with active record or active record migrations, those typically involve um, just modifying or adding and removing fields or just changing the, uh, the type of a field. Um, in our experience, um, there's a couple of advantages to also doing these sort of small semantic migrations in a script as opposed to um, as opposed to just pointing and clicking in a MongoDB GUI. Because think about it, you could just go into Studio 3T and click a bunch of transactions, edit the settlement date, and you're done, right? Uh, so why write a script? Um, two reasons. One, um, uh, First reason is you get, if you commit a script to GitHub, 
you have a permanent or semi-permanent record of all the migrations that you ran. So because at Booster we wrote, uh, we wrote every single migration through this scripting framework, um, we made it so that we can go back to, oh, what migrations did we run a year ago? And we have a record of all the changes that were kind of made through the database. Um, another, another reason would be, because, would be to enable developers that either might not be comfortable working with MongoDB or might not have direct read access or write access to the database to, uh, to write migrations. So one, uh, one great example that made me really proud was we, have, uh, we had some pure iOS developers at Booster that worked on our mobile apps. Um, no experience with JavaScript or MongoDB or Node at all, but they felt comfortable writing migrations because um, not, only did, uh, not only were there checks in place in GitHub to make sure they weren't doing anything terribly wrong, but then there was also a code review process. So instead of, the, uh, instead of be, being given the responsibility to, okay, open up the production database, don't mess anything up too badly, <laughs> otherwise you'll crash the whole system, now you have this like, standard code review process where you write a migration, um, a senior developer signs off on it, even if you don't have much experience with that particular set part of the, pro of the software system or that particular model, um, you at least get someone's eyes on it to make sure that you're doing something that won't blow up horribly. So, so that's what migrations are and a few examples of what, uh, what sort of migrations we've run through, this, uh, through similar frameworks. So what makes migrations difficult? Well, first of all, migrations can be very slow. Um, I'm sure many of you have spent hours staring at a computer screen hoping that your migration goes off without a hitch. Um, they can modify millions, tens of millions of documents. Um, another reason, migrations are very, very, very hard to test. Because again, you might be migrating 10 million documents. So every single data inconsistency that has ever happened in the history of your system may cause the migration to crash. So there's just a combinatorial explosion of things that can go wrong. Um, another problem is a lack of observability. Um, if you're writing a migration, it's hard to like, write it with observability in mind. Um, typically, frameworks are good for that. Um, migrations modify a lot of documents, so it's hard to store the exact results or what changed in the database. And existing APM solutions, say New Relic, even Sentry, are mostly built with, uh, with servers in mind, with uh, classic web applications. They're not built to store the results of one-off scripts that, uh, that run for hours and modify a whole bunch of data. So I don't really think there's a good tool out there for running migrations at scale. So that's why we, uh, we built one. So um, quick, quick overview of the Mongoose migration framework. The goal for, of the migration framework is to be a framework for durable observable scripting with Node.js and MongoDB using Mongoose. So first, meant to have minimal overhead and give you maximum benefit in terms of just the frameworky features of tracking what changes and giving you, um, giving you certain other features. So minimal overhead, all you're going to do is, or in the most basic case, let me see if my pointer, there we go. So um, if you're already writing migrations with Mongoose, probably looks pretty similar in the sense that you import Mongoose, connect to Mongoose, update a bunch of documents. So in this case, I am importing a character model, which is maps one-to-one -to, -one to a collection, and setting every character shipped to USS Enterprise, because I love Star Trek, great. Um, the only thing that I'm adding here, uh, migrations that start migration, migrations that end migration. That's, uh, that tells, um, it tells you when the migration is started and when the migration is finished. And from a basic command line perspective, uh, from a command line perspective, run this at the command line, you get some nice debug output. That's, uh, that's a start, but where things get a little bit more interesting is the migration framework UI. Um, we actually put together a, um, a UI on top of our migration framework. Um, this UI basically displays all sorts of information that you might want to know about a migration like when it started, when it ended, um, the operations that ran. I'll go into a little bit more detail about it later, but the UI is structured as a Express sub app, so you can either mount it, if you're using the Express Web Framework, you can mount it on your main production app, or you can just run it as a separate service. 
Um, but first, let's let's take a quick look at the the overarching priorities or the things that the migration framework is designed to achieve. Um, first of all, uh, safety and not running the same migration twice. Um, there's two reasons for not wanting to run the same script twice. One, we assume that again you're committing your uh, your migrations to a GitHub repo. So then the question becomes like, oh, do you uh, do you run every migration every single time? Uh, no, we actually track the migrations by uh, by their file name and make sure that you don't re uh, rerun migrations that you already ran. Number two, again, um, oftentimes rerunning a migration is either wasteful or creates the opportunity for some data inconsistencies and bugs. Um, monitoring is another priority, making sure that you can babysit a migration even though you don't necessarily want to. But being able to have um, insight into, okay, like how is my migration doing? How far along is it? Um, let's see, how many documents has it updated? How many does it still need to go? Have a rough estimate of all that. So you can kind of eyeball how long you have to go and, oh, is it, uh, is it doing okay? Is it running really slow? Who knows? Um, reporting, specifically for historical purposes as well as having people, uh, as, as well as if your product manager asks you, oh, did you run that migration? How many, uh, how many documents did it update? What happened with it? Now you have a link that you can point them to. And durability is a big one for us, um, specifically avoiding certain common errors that cause problems in migrations. And the other point is allowing, uh, allowing restarting a migration halfway through. A little bit more about that later. But at a high level, let's also talk about things that we're explicitly not designing for. Um, number one question that I always get whenever I say I'm writing a migration framework is, uh, "Oh, do you support reverting? Do you have to uh, do you have to write a teardown or something like that for your uh, for your migration?" And in my experience, um, reverting a migration is not something that you really want to do. In terms of thousands of migrations that I've ran in the past, I've only had, I, there's only been about two or three times when I ran the migration and then I realized that it was a terrible idea and I needed to revert it immediately. So it doesn't happen that often in my experience. What is more likely in my experience is the migration fails halfway through and I want to pick it up where it left off after making a quick fix or I want to write a separate migration because the, uh, the particular implementation wasn't right originally. Um, another common thing that migration frameworks do is versioning. So each document would have like, oh, I'm on schema version seven or schema version eight. Um, that's not something that we're supporting right now or at least not planning to for the immediate future. Um, the reason for that is, again, um, the small semantic migrations are something that we also want to support. So if you have a script that updates the settlement date on five transactions, you don't necessarily want to increment the document version on every single transaction ever. That's a little, uh, it's a little wasteful and also not very useful. So we may support in the future, if you're doing a purely structural migration, updating the, uh, the document version while still letting semantic migrations um, execute without updating a document version. Uh, but that's, uh, that's future problems. And then also another thing that we don't want to do is we don't want, to be, uh, we don't want the UI to be a tool for writing and editing migrations. We want, uh, we want you to be able to monitor a migration, but we want you to write the migrations in your normal code flow. So, you know, VS code, whatever you use, you write your migration there, you commit it to your usual code review tool, whether it's GitHub, GitLab, Garrett, whatever you prefer, and then it gets deployed, um, and then you can monitor the migration from the migration framework UI. So let's go a little bit more detail into, um, into what the migration framework gives you, what are some of the features from a more concrete perspective. So Sample, uh, sample migration again, um, import the migration framework that gives, uh, that tells the migration framework to register a bunch of mongoose middleware in order to intercept all, uh, all update operations, finds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, import a character model, import mongoose, uh, connect to mongoose, call start migration to tell the framework that, okay, I'm starting a migration now. And now I'm going to update every single character's ship property and set it to the string USS Enterprise. So first of all, again, um, we don't want to allow duplicate migrations because um, one, we have a GitHub repo that has a bunch of migration files in it. So we don't want to rerun every migration every time. And we also don't want to run the risk of a duplicate causing data inconsistency. 
So I run uh, I run set ship once, it works. I run set migra or set ship the second time, migration set ship already ran. Um, in the UI, um, we track a bunch of different properties related to a migration. So obviously, basic stuff, start and end time. Um, the author, so the person that uh, that last contributed to the uh, to the migration via git blame output is the person that's considered as the author. So you know who to uh, who to blame if the migration goes wrong or who to call if, it's, uh, if something strange happened with it. Um, we also store the git hash. This one is uh, surprisingly important because sometimes a migration goes through different iterations. So it's good to have a record of, oh, okay, this is the actual git hash that was uh, that, uh, that this particular code base was on when this migration ran. So now you can dig through, okay, what were the package.json dependencies? What was, um, well, what other migrations ran? Makes it, uh, makes it much easier to figure out exactly what happened, especially going further back in the past. Um, we also actually store the entire source code of the migration as well, just for, uh, just for debugging purposes and co-locating data to make it easier to, um, easier to take a look and see at a glance what went wrong. Um, that's for a future feature that we would love to support, which is highlighting the exact line that your migration failed in this, uh, in this UI. And then finally, we also store uh, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a full a list of operations, including um, what operation ran. So in this case, update many, um, whether it succeeded or failed, start time, end time, and the actual results. So you can track, okay, this update many updated three documents and have a permanent record of that that you can refer to days, weeks, months, years later. So again, why is, uh, why is monitoring important? Um, and I, if I had a dollar for every time a product manager asked me, oh, did you, uh, did you run this migration? What happened with it? And uh, well, in this case, with this framework, I have a link that I can send to them that's like, okay, this, here's some stats on the migration. It ran these updates, um, it updated these documents. Here's the, here's the end result. Okay, did it, uh, if it didn't work, we're gonna write a new migration. If it did, great, we're, uh, we're good. So kind of like have, if you guys have ever used Sentry for error tracking, um, I'm trying to get a similar experience with the Mongoose migration framework in the sense that Sentry gives you a URL that you can point someone to for a particular error. So you, uh, so an error occurs in production, you have a link that you can point to that has, okay, here's the stack trace, here's the git hash that, uh, that the error occurred on, here's the, um, here's the last 10 times this error happened based on the same error message. So I want the same kind of experience in terms of sharing a URL with all the relevant information, but for my migrations. So monitoring and progress migrations. Um, here's a migration that is purposely designed to be slow. So I'm going to iterate through every single episode and set the, uh, and set the season to one. So I have 26 Star Trek The Next Generation episodes. And whew, my YouTube video, well, hard to tell, but at the very least, it's updating the, um, updating the current counter over there in real time. And then once it's done, which will take a little bit, but... Should have made this video a little faster. But bottom line, if you want to babysit a migration, you can, um, you can, log, you can pull up the migration framework at any time and see what the status of the migration is. And it updates um, in the back end, currently using a RESTful API, but hopefully later using the, uh, the newly updated change streams that uh, if you saw the talk yesterday. Oh, okay. And it changed to done at the very end. Give me a second. There we go. So now the migration changed to complete, so great. So uh, durability and cursor timeouts, which is, uh, has always been the bane of my existence when running migrations. Um, how many of you have run into the, this cursor ID not found error? Yeah, love, uh, love that one. Um, that's because there's a couple of uh, related causes for this issue. So first, um, cursors timeout in MongoDB by default after 10 minutes but you can opt out of that with, uh, with the no cursor timeout flag. However, um, you know, you always forget, or at least I always forget to set it, and other developers on my team have forgot to set it as well. So we set that by default for you, but even then, um, 
no cursor timeout isn't enough because um, MongoDB has, uh, MongoDB sets a session by default on every cursor. And a cursor has what's known as a, or sessions have what's known as a logical session timeout. So if a session isn't used in 30 minutes, it gets killed and then the cursor that's associated with the session gets killed as well. Now the problem there is if you spend more than 30 minutes processing a particular batch of a cursor, that you'll run into a session timeout and you'll, uh, you'll get a similar error to this one. Um, and even if you set no cursor timeout, the cursor could still disappear on you. So um, the each async function uh, that the migration framework exports actually lets you, um, actually automatically restarts after a cursor ID not found error right where it left off. And then one thing that I'm, one part of the migration framework that I'm particularly proud of is, um, is being able to restart a migration halfway through um, without having this, uh, oh, how many of you have had to um, have a script fail halfway through so then you comment out a bunch of code and rerun it from the, big, from the middle? Yeah, that's, uh, this is what restarting does for you automatically. So again, here are four documents. Um, and we want to uh, we want to set we want to split up the name property into a first name and a last name. Now, uh, key problem here: no last name. So again, another case of assume you in this case it's easy, but assume if you have ten million documents and you have like one little edge case that crashes your entire migration. Um, so in this case, if uh, if first name and last name are both required, this particular save will throw on the third of four characters because you end up with an empty last name with the particular implementation of splitting first name and last name that I have here. So what happens here? So again, uh, problem is I have last name is required. So I run set names, get one, two, three. Okay, and then I get a path last name is required. So after three documents, the migrations failed and we, uh, and well, I need to go in and restart and fix it. So what I would do is I would go in, comment out this required true because, okay, I don't necessarily want last name to be required. Actually, Steve will remember we had an issue like this with, uh, with both title and response and text being required on a, on a post, uh, on some sort of migration with posts, I forget exactly. Um, so restarting a failed migration, set the restart equals one flag and it picks up where it left off. Document three updated, document four updated. And create, and when you uh, when you rerun a restart a migration, you get the same migration but just a copy of it. Um, other things that we uh, another particularly neat feature that we have, um, each async tracks the current document that it's on in a very good way. So one of the things we can actually report on is okay, each async failed um, halfway through. What's the document that it failed on? Which is a which is a question that is surprisingly hard to answer if you're not uh, if you're not specifically designing for your migration to or to catch errors in your migration, you might get an error message that includes the document's ID, but you don't get the full document or the current state of the document. In this case, the migration framework actually gives you okay, here's uh, here's the error message, and oh by the way, here's the document that uh, that the migration failed on, and this is uh, this is. Well, Another case where we would love to have also highlighting of the li exact line that failed in the UI. So are they, uh, let me see how I'm doing on time. So at core level, let me just give you a high level overview of how the migration framework works under the hood. Um, two mongoose models, underscore migration, underscore operation. Um, when you start a migration, then inserts a new migration document, and then every single operation that you execute, whether it's an update many, a save, a, um, a find one and update, all these end up as operation entries in the operations collection. So importing the, uh, the migration framework registers a bunch of mongoose middleware that's then able to intercept every single operation you do and catch things like, okay, you, uh, you called update many with these parameters. This is when the update many started. This is when the update many ended. Here's how many documents it updated all this data stored uh, for under the hood. So start migration, you call start migration, inserts a, new, uh, inserts a new entry into the migrations collection, name, status, author, um, all the basic information that you would expect given the, uh, given the UI that you saw. Um, 
what do you call update many. Um, this ends up as a document that looks like this in the database. So you get a parent pointer up to the migration ID. You get the model name and operation name that were, uh, that were updated, the status, um, any errors that occurred, the parameters that you passed in, including um, the actual update, the filter, uh, start at, and also the result, which includes modified count and matched count. So now you can, so now you get automatically, okay, what happened with this particular update many? And then the UI is a REST API for now on top of, uh, on top of this data. So here is a migration document, name, status, all that. That ends up being rendered by a view UI in the front end over here. And um, restarting is probably the most sophisticated part of the migration framework. Um, it's, uh, it's a little tricky to figure out exactly which operation is, lines up with which one, but we do a pretty decent job if you don't change too many things. So when you restart a migration, you copy all of the previous migrations operations. And accept, and you start, and the new migration has an empty last operation ID. Um, again, a migration has a last operation ID property that stores, okay, this is the last operation that I executed, or the last operation that I started, including ones that may have errored out. So on restart, um, each operation is going to look for previous operations that match. So that means that you can rerun a migration without actually changing the migration code. You can go in and just really quickly tweak your database schema or something different in order to and restart halfway through. So each async also, like, one of the reasons why we used each async is, well, one, for cursor timeouts because cursor timeouts have caused me a lot of trouble in the past. Um, number two, so we can track, again, where you are in the, um, in the actual cursor in a, uh, in a more durable way. And we explicitly sort by underscore ID at first, or by default rather, in order because, um, well, because underscore ID always has an index. So at the very least you can sort based on an index. And underscore ID is usually a decent thing to sort by if you don't have anything else to sort by. So if you're using the same each async, we're going to skip to, and you end up at that point in the migration. Um, uh, the each async will skip to the last ID that it saw. So it won't actually call each async, or it won't call the each async callback on any of the previous documents. Um, one of the uh, one of the other reason, or one of the other features that we have is um, we also match um, each async based on the user function name. So um, so you don't necessarily have to worry about. Um, it gives you a bit better filtering on which, uh, which migration you're, or which, uh, which function you're using. I don't know, forget that. <laughs> anyway, and uh, restarting can also skip an entire update many call. Um, kind of like how each async skips a bunch of documents when you get to an each async that, has, that is half finished or skips an each async entirely. Um, if you have an update many that has executed successfully, um, we will check to see if you're updating the same model with the same filter and the same update. If you are, we skip it. Um, however, the problem there is, or one particular edge case that we haven't quite figured out a good solution for, is if your each async fails halfway through for like, I don't know, some, uh, how to put it, I don't know, duplicate key error or something like that, um, we do not handle that case yet. However, we will try to figure out a way to do that for the future. Um, Related to that, some future work that we're going to do related to the migration framework. Uh, number one thing we want to do is notifications. So you don't really have to worry about babysitting a migration. You can at least get an email notification if it failed or succeeded. Um, again, really want this feature where you show the exact line that caused an error. It's one of those things where like, maybe you could probably figure it out yourself, but it is really cool to see it, figure it out on its own. Um, in terms, of, uh, in terms of tooling, we also want to make it very easy to run through GitHub workflows because um, the problem right now is the migration framework, you, explicit, you have to run it through Node and call start migration and end migration. Um, if we make it so that we're actually running through a, a Mongoose migration framework CLI, now we, can make it, uh, now we can design things to make it easy for you to run this in GitHub workflows without having to call start and end migration yourself and without having to, to determine which migrations to actually run. Um, a cloud version also would be nice. 
Uh, we currently only let you self-host on an Express web server for now. And then, uh, well, the UI is based on a REST API. So the, uh, the live updates that you saw were based on polling every second. Um, in the future, I'd love to use change streams for that. And I'm really excited about the new change streams coming in, Mo in uh, MongoDB 6, or already here in MongoDB 6. But yeah, uh, the migration framework is currently in private beta. Um, it's available for Mongoose Pro subscribers and part of something we're working on called the Mongoose Admin Panel. So to learn more about Mongoose Pro, um, come talk to me after this talk or check out Mongoose on GitHub sponsors or our, uh, the Pro website is pro.mongoose.dev or you can just email me for more information. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Here's a cute picture of a Mongoose. Questions, comments? Yeah? So um, the, all the examples in the updates, yeah. personally, whenever I do a lot of the search based on things from the implementation team and all that, they would be sort of just the aggregation of what they are. Um, we would catch what data goes into the aggregation and what data comes out. Okay. So you would get the result out, but on the other hand, um, uh, pipelines like dollar out don't necessarily give you like the most relevant information, so it wouldn't be as good. Um, although I would love to do that in the future, but I would need like some sort of way to kind of pipe into the, uh, the server to pull out like the more detailed information on the aggregation. Let's see, anyone else? Uh, over here? Oh, sorry. I'll get you next. Well, all right. Um, I mean, um, the Mongoose migration framework doesn't do anything too special other than monitor the results of your, uh, of your migration. So you can always use the, uh, the, the transaction helpers that come with the MongoDB node driver or with Mongoose. And um, you know, you, uh, if, your mig if your transaction fails halfway through, then the normal rollback procedure applies. And then, um, and then the migration framework kind of just picks up on what the, uh, what the particular error was that caused your transaction to fail. Okay, so this is a thing that I kind of took that I've applied to Mongo in terms of yeah, yeah. with Mongo's migration. Yeah, exactly. All you really need to do is import the migration framework, call start migration, call end migration. Um, everything else you can write exactly the same as you've been writing before. So again, meant to be very minimal overhead. Um, in order to let you do what you're already doing with a little bit of extra um, oversight and taking care of the plumbing of storing, okay, what were the results? Great. Um, yes? I have another question. We literally just migrated to MongoDB. It's one of the major problems finding migration frameworks. So I literally <laughs> saw Google for a good six hours trying to find um, an NPM library. So uh, this is not public. Is, is it publicly available? I was sort of looking for the documentation. So when I Not yet. Private. About, uh, like, where is this library? <laughs> Not yet. Very much, uh, very much in a private alpha, but, okay. uh, but happy to talk to you about it um, after the talk. Cool, thanks. Um, get you the information. Uh, well, back there. Um, not currently, but that is a very good idea. Um, that's something that I really should, uh, should look into because, again, that's been a concern for me in the past as well. Um, again, like if you run one of the risks of running a big migration is um, is you might slow the rest of the database down, right? So if you're just writing as fast as you possibly can, you might impact um, you might impact customers that are using your app. So putting in like uh, speed bumps for your uh, migration could be a useful feature as well. So I'll consider that. Thank you for the great idea. This is why I love giving these talks. Some people always come up with great ideas. Um, 
Not necessarily. It depends on if you, if your, does your dev environment point to the production database? No. No? Okay. In that case, it wouldn't treat it as the same because again, um, the way that the migration framework works is it actually registers models on your, in your particular database. So it would actually insert migrations into your dev database and use that to track what migrations have already run. Um, um, so you would, if you mounted a, it depends on what, uh, it depends on what database your, uh, your UI is pointed to. So um, you pass, when you, uh, when you instantiate the UI, you actually need to pass it a, um, a mongoose instance or a mongoose connection, or it just uses the mongoose instance, uh, just require mongoose by default. So if you attach, uh, if you say mount a sub app on your production app, um, that will be pointed to your production application. Or if you connect, or if you have a separate service that's pointed to the production database, then the migration framework will be looking at the production database. But you're, long story short, you're responsible for, uh, for telling the migration framework which database you're looking at. And that's the database that it will be migrating, and that's the database that it will be storing data in. Make sense? Cool. Uh, yes? Uh, no, but that's another great idea that I need to look into. Um, because yeah, if I remember correctly, bulk write, you can do, um, how to put it, you can do like an uh, or unordered bulk write. That basically means like execute every bulk write operation that you can, and if some error out, just give me the error back. So that's something that I that we can in theory support. We can all we can pull from the result which uh, which bulk writes failed, um, but but we don't have support for that currently. So another great idea. Thank you. Uh, yes, back in the back. I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the question. Um, uh, so, uh, so rollback, we don't really have any support for that. So we don't store previous uh, the previous state of the data. Um, on a, with the potential exception of if an error occurred, we do store the state of the document when the error occurred. Um, that, what was the second question? Yeah. Yes. First, I touch it here, and then I'm going to touch there and no. But yeah. this error is on the fifth one. Yeah. So you are able to resume only the sixth one also, and you start to start five child and everything. So you are able to track of that update and then resume only on the sixth one. Um, so in, in the model that we're looking at, like if you update the series, like that update is already done. So then you move on to updating the episodes. So then if you halfway through your episode, if, uh, halfway through updating a bunch of episodes, then it will, uh, then you restart, it'll pick up like right where you left off on the episodes. So it will assume that the, uh, that the series migration or the series update is already done. Yeah. Cool. Yes? Yeah, that's by default. But is there any way to use it to give the service for run? And then the service Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, there is. Um, that's actually a pattern that we make very heavy, or made very heavy use of at my previous role, which is um, we would have a separate folder for every version or a quote unquote version of the quote unquote service that was running the migrations. 
So we would have like, okay, we're going to release version 1.28.4 and in 1.28.4, we're going to run these migrations. And the way we would represent that is we have uh, directory v1.28.4 slash migration name. And that would be the name of the migration. Um, so the migration framework supports, um, if in start migration, you can pass it a name option that tells, okay, this is the name of the, uh, the migration. So if you want to, if you actually explicitly want to rerun a migration, you could just copy it over to, okay, the next release, so v1.28.5, I want to rerun set ship from v1.28.4. Just copy it over to v1.28.5 directory and it will rerun. Yeah? Unfortunately not. Um, the problem with, uh, with using the aggregation framework is, um, at least from the Mongoose perspective, is I'm sending an aggregation command to the server, the server does its thing and sends me back a result. So I don't really, have, so the migration framework doesn't really have a way to go into the server and say, what's the current status of the, mig of the aggregation, how far has it gone along, so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, you would. So that's uh, that's a current limitation, unfortunately, and one that I don't think we have a good workaround for, um, other than uh, use um, well, use the uh, use update many and use simple operations as opposed to uh, using the uh, using aggregations. Yeah, that's what the framework Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yes. Oh yeah, of course. Oh, nobody wants to take the picture of the cute mongoose. I think that mongoose is so cute. <laughs> it's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. Anyone? Anyone else have any questions? No? All right. Great. Well, thank you so much. It was so great to be here. <laughs>